It's directly in line with the Secretary of Defense's number one priority, and that's the protection of you and your families. It's your safety and your health. We're taking that very seriously, and we're treating it like we're at war. Our second priority is to continue the vital missions that we have as a combatant commander. The United States Southern Command is charged with defending the United States, our homeland. And we have to take that seriously. We have to balance that with our number one priority. That has led us to do a number, number of actions here. I mentioned telework shift work, flexible work schedules. We've instituted health protection condition charting. We'll talk more about that during the questions and answers. We've been very serious about our social distancing, about the actions we've taken to uh, practice safe and, and clean hygiene. And, uh, and we've provided an increased number of supplies for people to do that. We've instituted procedures here at uh, the Garrison, and I know our component uh, teammates that are, that are listening in today have done the same, where we've had to close essential services like our child development centers, our exchanges, our food courts, and other areas to minimize the risk of spreading this rapidly uh, spreading uh, disease. I want to end, before we get into questions, and I pass to Sergeant Major, by letting you know that each and every one of our teams is valuable. No matter what your circumstance right now, right now is, whether you're teleworking, uh, shift working, uh, working from home, we know it's not optimal. This is not the way that the team functions at, at our best. But I feel that in this time of crisis, I'm seeing the best in our team and the best in each and every one of you. So just to reiterate, this is our team. This is who we are, what we do every day. The team is very important. Being professional, doing the right thing. We are the most professional force in the United States, military forces. So we must be accountable for our actions, our people, who we are, what we do. We must take responsibility. If we see something wrong, we must fix it. That's our job. We can end this now, or it just could go on for a long period of time. But follow the CDC rules and make things happen. Thank you. So the first question will be for you, sir. Have we had any positive COVID-19 cases in the command? And if so, how will we handle them? We've had three positive cases of COVID-19. We've had one here at the headquarters, one in our garrison here in Miami, and one of, one of our components. But we, weeks ago, we established procedures in case of a positive. We rehearsed those procedures. And then when we received the positive, put those procedures in place. Priority being taking care of the individual, and anyone that individual may have been in contact with. We have a way to map the location and how those individuals have traveled through our headquarters using our systems and our processes. And so I'm confident, along with our, our cleaning, our deep cleaning, we instituted a more robust cleaning contract that we're able to contain it and ensure the safe and healthy work environment has been prior one. I know Dr. Moran has some things to add for that. Absolutely, sir. So we follow the Center for Disease Control guidelines for determining who is a close contact and who is at risk. So using those procedures that you mentioned, being able to internally track people and see who they had close contact with, we're able to determine who is at most at risk, who needs to self-isolate, i.e. stay home for 14 days, and monitor for symptoms. We work closely with the Department of Health and the Center for Disease Control to figure out what those next steps are. We've done that with each of our cases, um, and we've been able to have individual contact with those individuals and, um, and ensure that they are all protected. Second question, what can we expect for long-term changes? How can we better prepare for the next crisis? The Department of Defense Institute some very aggressive guidelines on March 11th that uh, significantly curtailed our activities, our, our travel, and, uh, and our events for two-month period. So I call that the initial phase. And the, the goal there is to contain the spread and ensure that the department can continue to conduct its essential missions around the globe, protecting and defending the United States of America and carrying on our operations. So that, that is phase one. I think when we get beyond that, and the department will reassess uh, where we think we are in the, the rise of the disease globally and in the United States and in individual areas as we go forward, uh, it's beyond that where we get to some steady state level, how we work with the, uh, the reality of coronavirus uh, as part of one of the uh, infectious uh, diseases that we have to face here in the United States, and how we balance that with our mission. And then when will we have our team 
I'll come back to full manning in the mission areas here at the headquarters, our components and across the department. That's We have not determined that. I think all of us have to prepare uh, that this will happen for the full two months, and then there'll be some phasing in of manning and missions after that. But it will, it has resulted in cancellation of key events, some of our exercises and conferences and travel. It certainly has restricted our access uh, here to headquarters and with our components. So we're doing everything virtually. Uh, we're doing things online by the phone. We're practicing good hygiene when we do that by wiping down our phones and keyboards and those sorts of things that uh, everyone should be practicing. So we're looking at this as a, as a phase operation and we're looking at this over time. With the number of people teleworking, what's being done to improve the IT infrastructure and bandwidth? Well, I'd like to just thank our our communicators. So J6 is the organization that, that runs that for us, how they flex. No one envisioned a, a situation where the entire Department of Defense, which is the largest, if it was a company, the largest corporation in the world, the largest organization in the world, asked its team to maximize teleworking all within a, about a week's period of time. And that included us here. And so uh, the team's done that. We've pushed out as many uh, devices and methods of doing that as we can. And so what I ask people is to just remember what, what you may be frustrated with bandwidth. The entire globe is pushing telework uh, in addition to the Department of Defense. And we're trying to do this within the Department of Defense by ensuring that we maintain our necessary operational security, which we have for our all of our systems, whether it's a unclassified cell phone or, or a, an internet access. And so we have to balance all of this as we go forward. So look at ways to innovate, look at ways to pace yourself. Use the the, uh, the portal that we've developed on our, our web page. You can link on it, it's COVID-19, it's a little IT help, best practices and tips. We created another site we call APAN. You can access that, you have to get permissions to go in there, but it allows a, a repository of information. Uh, so we've, we've really rapidly flexed. However, I know it's not the same and the bandwidth is, is not keeping up with uh, the demand. And folks are working hard to get through that. There's been a lot of um, a lot of talk about testing. Is testing available within the command? And if somebody is concerned, that's where you see. Absolutely. So testing is available here. And the first thing that I would like to remind everybody is if you have any symptoms that you think might be COVID-19, please, please stay home. Symptoms of COVID-19 may mimic other viruses that are out there, especially right now since it's cold and flu season. So the symptoms could be something as simple as a cold, runny nose, cough. You could have a fever, body aches, headache. You could have more significant symptoms like difficulty breathing or something as simple as a loss of sense of smell or taste can be also be associated with COVID-19. So if you have any of those symptoms, it is important to call your provider. If you are enrolled here at our clinic, they do have the ability to test. They have a phone number. Um, it is 305-437-1721. That phone number is manned 24 seven as a COVID-19 hotline. People are standing by there to answer your questions, walk through your symptoms, your underlying health conditions, your risk factors to see if you may be exposed and if you need to have um, testing done. If you need to have testing done, the clinic here, like other clinics in the community, have the ability to swab and then send off that sample to a, a reference lab um, to be evaluated. Sometimes the testing can back, come back quickly, sometimes not so quickly. The United States as a whole is working through those testing challenges right now, but we are seeing increasing test sites um, uh, pop up all over the community. I would highly recommend that before you drive, come to our clinic or to any other test site though, that you call first, because they'll walk you through your symptoms and make sure that they can provide the services that you're looking for there so that you're not frustrated. We, like everybody else, are rapidly um, uh, just watching the situation as it's rapidly evolving. Across the world, medical researchers all over are learning more and more about this virus every single day. Here at Southcom, we are in communication every single day with the Center for Disease Control, and we are learning along with them. So you will see that testing, the criteria for testing a couple of weeks ago, is different today than it was two weeks ago. So just um, 
a night or two ago, they released new guidance for us. So now, folks that work in critical infrastructure, i.e., those of us here that are mission essential for the Department of Defense, those first responders and others, do have priority B testing. So that gives us a lower threshold to be able to test folks with symptoms. Thanks, Doctor. I'd just like to also put a stop on uh, getting that accurate information as the situation evolves. It is rapidly changing. You know, we think where we've come as a nation in the last month and as a command in the last few weeks. And so uh, I know we just talked about uh, IT bandwidth in the last answer, but those websites, the Southcom website, we're putting the best and latest information that we can. And for our family members, I would encourage you to go to our website and link to the Family Readiness Group, Team Southcom. And, and we're spending our team, the volunteers that are part of that family readiness group, are spending a lot of time posting information that's pertinent uh, to your your situation and uh, and sharing best practices and what others have learned as we work through this together. Absolutely. And the CDC website for COVID-19 is, is constantly being updated. They have a great self-checker on there. So if you have some symptoms and you want to go on there, you can um, do that right online from the ease of your home. Sergeant Major, this one's for you. How are we dealing with the restrictions and the impacts placed on our students with things like travel restrictions and how they impact uh, some of our key events, whether they're here in the community or in the AOR? Um, what an example is the gala event was scheduled for 15 May. That's a great example. April, or May 15th was our gala, what we're supposed to be doing. But the DOD policy is no large gatherings. So we're gonna hold off doing things that we would normally do because we don't want to violate those rules and have, have people get uh, COVID-19. So it's it's important that we follow the rules and regulations signed by CDC, and we keep those rules and regulations in our forefront to make sure everybody's doing the right thing all the time. If possible, we'll take those, uh, like the gala, we'll push it back out further and set another date for it. And here, to Sarge Major's point, here's the headquarters. The guidelines is less than 10 people in a meeting here at the headquarters. I'm not having a meeting with more than two two people, sometimes three. And uh, we're doing everything virtually. We're really emphasizing that no group PT, no group formations here. It's appropriate for our command. That won't work for every command. And commanding officers are empowered and they're senior enlisted to make the right decision. But for a headquarters command like this, we're really distributing the work uh, distributing the uh, folks in the meetings and doing things virtually. That, that applies to uh, team building events like our gala or annual ball. The 15 May was so close to the 11 May deadline that we decided to cancel that. What are the impacts from Health Protection Condition Charlie to South Health personnel? Think about Health Condition Charlie like this. So we here in Miami, we're very familiar with hurricane conditions as a hurricane bears down on us. Since 9-11, the nation's, uh, our nation has been a very uh, used to force protection conditions, particularly the military as a threat to terrorist threats ramps up and down. We ran, we changed the condition, it means different things. This is what we're in with our our, our force health protection condition. So Charlie is, a, is on the escalation, uh, going from Bravo to Charlie, which we did this week for every Department of Defense installation worldwide was a recognition of the rapidly changing, complex nature of this fight that we're in against Corona-19, coronavirus-19. And so what it means is that we've really restricted the number of places, think of these as sort of intersections where people might come in contact that would then increase the rate of infection. So places like food court, our exchange where you might go to shop, our child development center, the gym. Uh, we've uh, we've opened doors and, and allowed other changes to the access. We've uh, restricted access to the base to two forms of ID. So, for example, a retiree uh, that really didn't have an essential need to come on the base now won't be able to. Uh, it's inconvenient for sure, but it's the right thing to do for the war we're in against this virus. Doctor, I think you might want to add some medical aspects to that. Sure. So there's a lot of impacts, not just for the HP Charlie, but just for the world that we live in right now with a worldwide pandemic. 
And one of those questions that we're frequently getting is relates to what about my medical or dental procedures, my elective care that I'm coming up? Will I still be able to go to the doctor and get those things taken care of? All across the nation, healthcare facilities are postponing elective medical and dental procedures in accordance with the U.S. Surgeon General's advice. The DOD is no exception to that. We are following the same guidance. That's in order to not only conserve healthcare resources for the sickest people, but also to protect our patients, to protect our medical personnel, and to protect the community at large. So we'd all agree that when you go to the dentist, it's really hard to maintain six feet distance um, while they're working in your mouth. To protect you, many clinics across the nation, including our clinic here at the Army Garrison, have switched to providing routine and acute healthcare through telehealth services. The president and the Department of Health and Human Services have relaxed some of those HIPAA rules so that we're able to communicate um, in that regard to make sure that people's needs are being met. For some procedures, though, you can't do that just over telehealth. And for those individual things, we always recommend you reach out to your specialist, to your individual doctor, and talk through whether your individual care can be postponed and delayed or whether you need to be seen right now. Sorry, another one for you. Are exceptions to the current need policy being considered? Again, I, I'd like to just recognize the tremendous impact this has had on all of us, uh, personally, individually, as, as families and, and individuals, and how important leave and, and liberty and, and travel are to good order discipline in your own health. And uh, I think we would all agree this has had a, a tremendous impact. The, there are exceptions, and those exceptions are important. Those exceptions are, are framed around hardships, medical, and it goes back to our priority one. We want to take care of our team, protect our team and you. And sometimes that protection uh, will be enabled by allowing you to travel. And so we're, we have a process in place. Uh, we implemented procedures uh, to go through each request. It will come off the chain of command to the right level, and, uh, and we'll act on it promptly. But it is a serious fight we're in. And these very strict restrictions, uh, the, in my 38 years of service, Sergeant Majors, the, the toughest lockdown that we've seen is indicative of the serious nature of the threat that we face. So, uh, But if you think it's so exception worthy, I would encourage you to route it up. And you should get an answer promptly. And again, we're defaulting to our top priority, which is to take care of you. And often that is ensuring that your hardship medical circumstances taken care of that might mean might mean essential travel. I would note PCS leave moves are, are frozen as well. Again, there would be an exception perhaps if there was a need to move somebody uh, to fill a billet or a job that was considered in our second priority, the central missions. But again, the default is to stay in place, minimize the travel and contact and the chance of spreading this disease. Since we've got some people logged on right now from downrange, what's being done about our workforce in the region who may not have the same access to the health care we have here? The same priorities apply. Priority one, protection of our, our team. And the second is the essential completion of the mission. And so we, we've looked at each and every service member, civilian that is deployed, and we've done an assessment of that an assessment of whether they're protected and whether they should be on station to conduct their mission essential uh, tasks. We've also looked at what partner nations are doing. And in some cases, if there's no partner nation to work with, uh, then we've considered uh, moving our teams back and we've done that. So we're looking at each one uh, case by case, including those uh, teammates uh, in our uh, security cooperation offices, our, our senior defense officials at our embassies, working very closely with our embassies and we put out some guidance to help manage through that. And Sergeant Major, I know you want to talk about how important it is we, we take care of our, our team. It's our team, you know, we gotta take care of it all the time. It doesn't matter if you're downrange or, or here in the building, we have the same responsibility to take care of every team member in, in the command, in our, in our service. And that includes our contractors and our GS employees. Team one, team one fight. And if he's downrange, we'll figure out a way to get help to him or, or get them to us one way or another. And I'll just add to that, we are working closely with our TRICARE contractor, International SOS, um, to I, they've identified where the healthcare is. They, um, our folks at the embassies have the information that they need for reaching out 
to either get testing through a local healthcare facility or in some cases the testing is brought back here. We follow the same procedures that we would for any sick or um, um, ill or injured member that is downrange working with Transcom to air back them back if they were to become that sick. And uh, Dr. Moran, did uh, TRICARE lay out some processes for our overseas folks Absolutely. specifically for this situation? Absolutely. We have uh, provided flow charts down there for not only active duty but retirees, contractors, um, how folks are to access care, where they can get all of their needs met. So just like we provide the the 305-437 number here for our staff, there are numbers available for our folks downrange as well. And we've seen that play out this week when people have developed fevers and other symptoms that they've been able to get in and access care. And we'll, make sure those, patients. we'll make sure those are prominently posted on the resource sites that we mentioned earlier. Thank you. Another one for you, Sergeant Major. What does someone do if their CAT card or military dependent ID card is about to expire? So the first thing you do is you gotta look at the date. We're in reduced mandate uh, across the board. So the date is April 15th. If April 15th, if you're gonna, your CAT card is gonna be expired by April 15th, you need to make an appointment, call your nearest dear location, doesn't matter if you're Army South, NAV, NAVSO, or wherever it is, you need to make an appointment and have it fixed. You will have that priority if you're April 15th or, or earlier. Yeah, thanks, so we, we certainly recognize that having an active uh, valid CAT card as part of the mission. There's been some exceptions for dependents that have been put in place recognizing that since it's most mostly appointment only and it could be difficult to get a slot and certainly bringing your, your children and uh, dependents in at this point might be exactly opposite of what we need to do to shelter in place. Anything to add, Dr. Moran? Sure, yes sir. So TRICARE realizes that some people may have expired ID cards when they show up at the doctor's office. But when you show up at the doctor's office with that expired ID card, they're going to call back to TRICARE to um, ensure that you are still a dependent um, or still entitled to services. And TRICARE will work with your local doctor's office to go ahead and approve that a visit and approve those claims so that TRICARE is aware of the issue and they're working it. Thanks. Quick question on Facebook right now. Daniel Salgado is asking, will Panamax be canceled this year? Panamax is one of our premier exercises, very important. The Panama Canal is a strategic asset for the world and the United States, a tremendous volume of uh, trade goes through there. Panama is one of our premier partners of a wonderful, thriving democracy. And uh, we're going to look uh, really hard at how we continue with all our exercises. So uh, we've already uh, canceled and postponed some that we're, we're in that two month window that we're talking about out through May. We'll look at hard at the ones in the future. We may have to make some tough decisions. Uh, Panamex is one of our very, very important exercises. So we'll we'll try to do what we can to preserve that. Exercises are our North Star. It's what we do. It's what our team does to stay ready for the missions that we've been given from the Secretary of Defense, from the President. Uh, and so conducting these exercises is important, but we have to balance that versus our priority num number one right now, which is protection of each and every one of you. Will there be additional guidance on COVID travel restrictions and what constitutes extreme hardship or necessary for or what's necessary for humanitarian reasons? As we discussed, the, the hardship criteria is really humanitarian, medical related. Uh, we uh, we look at things like deaths in family and, and the tragedies that uh, unfortunately happen in, in the, this life that we are in. And so we'll look at each one of those, and uh, and uh, those are the two broad categories, and we'll consider on a case-by-case -case basis. We've approved some already, and uh, we'll approve the chain of command will be fair, but we'll look at each one through the lens of the war that we're in with the virus. And sir, I will add to that that we are in active discussions as well. Right now, if you return from international travel, um, you have a 14-day restriction of movement when you return. Uh, we are also looking at whether we need that for CONUS locations as well. Um, especially, so many states have already put that into place. So, for, for example, if you're traveling from New York, um, there's a lot of places that already have you in a hold um, for 14 days. We are looking at that as well as the situation continues to evolve. Uh, thanks for mentioning that too. And, and in terms of travel here, the, the recommendation is to shelter in place uh, here in the local area. Uh, local leave is authorized. So, in addition to telework or flexible schedules and shift work, that we've gone to to ensure the safety of our workforce. 
with the perch if, if the chain of command can support local leaf. Uh, that is restricted to a certain distance, and um, your, your chain of command should know that distance for wherever facility you're at. But uh, that is another option for time off as, uh, as you look to how to balance this, uh, this situation. So, sir, are you at all concerned about disinformation or misinformation from external state actors as we combat this uh, disease? In any war, ensuring that our team has accurate and timely and relevant information is a priority of commanders, command teams, up and down and across our formation. So uh, that's never more important than now. So our one of our priorities, we set one of our first principles we set to support our number one priority from the beginning was communicate, 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 and do so accurately and do so with speed. Uh, it's if you, it takes two days to get out an accurate communication is probably not fast enough given the the fight that we find ourselves in. All you have to do is, is sort through the various news feeds and uh, you're going to find uh, plenty of disinformation out there. That's why uh, Dr. Moran emphasized the CDC website, Center for Disease Control. It's factual, it's pertinent, it's focused. We have our own website. It's uh, not meant to in any way replace the CDC, but to augment that with some Southcom and DOD specific I, would, I mentioned our family readiness group a site, Team Southcom. You can link to that from our website. There's there's ways to get the facts. Facts are important. And make no mistake, our national defense strategy calls out great power competition. And there are other actors in this world that don't see democracy as a principal value, and they don't value freedom. And they'll exploit this, these external state actors, to spread their version of, uh, of a narrative or, or malign influence. And so we have to be really mindful of that. Stick to the facts, stay calm, educate each other, and look, as Sergeant Major said at the outset, look out for each other too. This is when you can uh, trade, trade the facts and help each other work through this. So this is our last question, and I'll direct this to either the doctor or the commander. And I actually have a service member in this position for reservists who demobilized during this period, if they complete their orders and leave active duty, is there any plan for follow-on here in the event they begin to exhibit symptoms after their orders terminate? I'll start with uh, the doctor, and then I'll kind of take it to a level, because I think there's a lot of unique situations that we're in right now. Absolutely, so each of the services does have a, a, a process in place to monitor those individuals, keep them on orders, take them to a, uh, put them in a place where they can um, ensure that they are cared for as they are coming off that 14 day restriction of movement period or coming off orders wherever their risk was, whether it was a contact or travel. So they'll need to work with their individual um, service to, to walk through what that looks like for them. It's really, they need to use your chain of command and, uh, properly. Ask the question of your chain of command. If they don't have the answer, then we bring it up to hire and we keep on going until we get an answer. That's right, and, and you should you should get prompt answers. And now, now's the time uh, more than any to get prompt answers to questions that you ask, and that's the pledge that we we give to you. Uh, I'd like to say too that there's going to be a lot of questions as this goes further, and you'll, you'll ask questions about what about my leave balance? I wasn't able to take leave uh, that I accrued, and how does that work as I get to the end of the year? I'm I'm confident that we will find answers to all these questions and work out solutions uh, within the Department of Defense and here at Southcom. And if you have a unique particular situation, uh, whether it's one based on a pending retirement, a transfer, a house hunting leave that got canceled, just you should ask and we'll work to ensure that you get the, the correct factual information. If we don't know the answer, we'll bump it up. Sir, any final word as we bring the town hall to an end? Absolutely. I'd, I'd like to Sergeant Major to have a final word and then Dr. Moran and then I'll close it out. So, thanks. so the, the boss has already said it, we're at war. It's our responsibility to take action. You know, take this seriously. Take this very seriously. You know, accountability and responsibility is on us, sir. Thanks, sir. Sir, I'll just add that not every person with coronavirus has a fever, shortness of breath, and difficulty breathing. We should assume that those of us around us uh, have um, the coronavirus and could be transmitting it, shedding it. 
So what we need to do is we all need to stay six feet apart from each other, keep washing our hands, stay home when we can, and take care of ourselves, look out for each other. We'll get through this. Thanks. I'd like to close by saying I'm proud of you, I'm proud of the, the hard work that we've done uh, to attack this um, this problem, this situation to date, how we've come together as a team, how we've really uh, upped our communications and the sense of teamwork. I've never been more proud to be part of the Department of Defense. I've seen the department move out smartly and take action, and uh, I believe that those actions are correct from forming the task force at the Pentagon level, uh, the leadership that our Northern Command commander is providing, working inside the continental United States, and our own team here where we've stood up a, a coronavirus task force and planning team that's working round the clock on procedures and follow-up and integration that we look, as we look at this over the next two months, next year and beyond. So it's important, we're focused on it. Our priority remains your protection, your health, your safety. And our second priority is continuing those vital and essential missions that are protecting and defending the United States of America. Thanks all of you, Team Southcom. Thanks for what you do. Thanks families for dialing in. Uh, thanks for working together. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for your tough questions. They make us better. You see something that we're missing, have an idea. Make sure you let us know, and we'll get back to you as, as quickly as we can. Thanks. Have a great day.